Thank you for allowing us to present the state of the schools. Very proud that we can have our students entertain us to start. I think that's probably the most powerful image of what we are able to offer our students and our communities. It's actually displayed by our students. So thank you to Mr. Plaster and his choir. We'll start with our three goals. We always start with uh, these goals in any presentation, whether it be to parents, whether it be to the community. Uh, we do this in our PTA meetings. We always want to make sure that it's very clear what we are about in the Parma City Schools. First, increasing student achievement. Clearly, we want to make sure that we take kids from whatever level they are and deliver them to a higher level of learning, a higher level of potential, a higher level of opportunity by the time they leave us. Improving transparency throughout our communities. Certainly, we'll talk more about that, but this is really part of that function, right? Part of presenting to you is so that you understand what we're about and that when you are out and about in the community, you have positive things to say about our school system because your word to your friends and to your neighbors is always more powerful than anything we can put in written word or any speech we can give. We appreciate your ambassadorship. And finally, practicing fiscal responsibility. That used to be the number one goal when we started here. Four years ago, we were in fiscal caution or fiscal watch. It was really a, a nasty status. We actually had state auditors come and sit in our finance meetings. We've been able to move out of that uh, through the leadership of Sean Nucio, our treasurer, if you can wave Sean. But more importantly than that, through all of the sacrifice uh, that our employee groups have made, that our staff has really taken on more with less, we've really been able to embody that in our time here. And as a result, we've been able to continue to have great offerings for our kids despite the fact that we haven't been able to pass new money. And we'll talk more about that as well. One of the uh, parts that we're most proud of in our Parma City Schools is the consistency in which we approach professional development, is the consistency in which we approach our expectations for teachers. Before you can have expectations, before you can have accountability, you have to have clarity. And we've been about this same playbook. We've handed this, in fact, it's a card stock handout. We've handed this same playbook to our teachers now all four years. And we've said, this is what we're about. And when it comes right down to it, it's authentic literacy. Read, write, discuss. We, we could do every single lesson, every single day around those three key words. Read, write, discuss. We base all of our professional development, all of our staff meetings, all of our teacher evaluations. We look at authentic literacy to make sure that our students are performing those things in our classrooms. Mrs. Tiffany Stropko, if she can wave, has been our assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction, and she's been phenomenal at leading this charge during our time. We've also talked uh, quite a bit about social-emotional learning. And this has been especially true coming out of the pandemic. We know that students spent so much time um, at home and didn't really get the chance to be within our guys for far too long uh, of, of a time and sort of got out of those procedures and those routines that, that we really hold so dear and that they really thrive from. And so our social-emotional framework has really been an important part of what we've done. And it's also important to, to understand the state has recognized that as well. The state used to have only academic standards. Now the state has embraced the, the phenomenon of educating the whole child. And so the state also presents to us, here's what we think you should do from a social-emotional standpoint. This used to be called character education. When it was called character education, it was popular. Now we call it social-emotional, and people think it's some type of controversial piece. This is really about addressing the whole child, making sure that we're meeting emotional needs in the classroom, because when a child is struggling, when a child has endured trauma, when a child has, is not able to, to, to behave in a way that is conducive to his or her learning environment, it's not only disruptive for that child, it's disruptive for the entire classroom. And so we know we have to attend to that, particularly coming out of COVID. We always make sure that we celebrate our career tech programming. programming. We did not actually, uh, last year, there's Amy Poppett. Go ahead, let's give her there. Let's applaud for her. I think she timed that on purpose. She knew that I was going to probably thank her, so she escaped a little bit. Um, our career tech programming is on par with anyone in Ohio. And I say that with uh, clear conviction and with the utmost level of confidence. Um, our career tech programs are, are 17 different programs, all in-house. We're one of the only school districts in Ohio to be able to do that. Most school districts either send uh, their students somewhere, for instance, Polaris would be somewhere we send students to. We don't. Uh, other school districts would. Or they partner. So you have four programs in this district, four in another, four in another, and you take buses. All of our programs are right here at our three high schools. We're extremely proud of the, the, the uh, results that they had. As I mentioned, we didn't get a formal report card last year because COVID was sort of a 
I don't want to say a past year, they still published one, but they didn't have the different grades and some of the different uh, data pieces that they had had in the past. But our career tech did receive a specific report card. We want to make sure we celebrate this because these numbers, again, on par with anybody in, in Ohio, 94.7% in post-program outcomes. That means you're employed, you're in the military, you have an apprenticeship or a post-secondary education within six months of your graduation. I've always said that that number, to me, as a parent, is the most important thing you can possibly do for me. That my kid has not just an idea, not just kind of floating around, but they have a clear plan and steps toward that plan. That, to me, is, is what we try, try to accomplish as a school district. So we're very proud of that. 94% four-year graduation rate, C certainly that's always our goal. Uh, some students make it into a five-year path. We discourage that, but students in a career tech are meeting that at a very high rate. 44% industry-recognized credential. That means when they walk in to a business or to an industry such as yours, they, it's not just an idea they have. They actually want to be able to say, we have tangible skills toward this. And then finally, 85% technical skill attainment. So, Many different statistics to show that we are very strong in terms of our career tech programming. As I said, we've worked really hard at our positive behavior interventions and supports. We have bronze medals at all of these schools. This is not a Parma Senior High or a Parma City Schools award. This is given by our Educational Service Center. So we have external folks come in, they take a look at our programming. We know that to have the best behavior possible, we have to have very clear structures very clear procedures and routines. And so all of our schools, minus one, have received some type of medal from the ESC. You see the bronze, very proud of our schools that accomplish bronze. Our silver, very proud of those, that's another level. That means we're not just good at tier one, we're good at tier two. And tier two means when you can't meet those levels of support, and we, when you can't understand our procedures or understand our, our, our routines, you can actually have additional interventions to make sure that you are able to stay in the classroom, that you are able to thrive, that your classmates are able to thrive. And so we had two schools achieve our silver medal, and our first school last year, John Muir, achieved our gold medal. And we're very proud of that. That's the first gold medal, not just in the Parma City Schools, but quite frankly, in any area school that I've heard of. So we really are at the cutting edge of PBIS and social emotional learning, and we're proud of the environments that we create in our school district. We also have worked hard to be what's called a, a one-stop shop. We're large still. We are the second largest school district in Cuyahoga County. We have 9,400 kids. Our size should always be an advantage. And one of the ways in which is it, it is an advantage is to create more opportunities and different opportunities for our students. We have the facilities. We have the talented staff. We have talented administrators that are able to lead different programs to, feed, to, to meet different student needs. First one that we talk about and are very proud of is ACES. Uh, ACES is under the direction of Mr. Robert Hoon, if he can wave. He's our director of uh, exceptional children, or director of the Office of Exceptional Children. ACES is actually in a, in a wing of Parma Senior High, and ACES this year has 13 students. And we're very proud of that. This is a school uh, specifically for students with autism. In the past, we were not able to educate these students. In the past, these students, once it came time to develop their IEP, we, we would typically find a different place to educate them. We want all of our students to be educated in the Parma City Schools. We believe that we will best beat their, meet their needs here. And we also believe that that connection to our school district and to our other students is best for their students, or it's best for these students and their families. Kindergarten Launch Academy. Kindergarten Launch Academy was a program that we, did, we began last year. This is for our youngest kindergarten students. In the past, there would have been two pathways for these students. We would have either not admitted them because their birthday said they were too young, or they would have been absolute terrors because they simply were not ready to actually be involved in a kindergarten classroom. Their parents wanted them here, but in terms of actually being able to be socially mature enough, they weren't even close to being there. So this year, actually we began this last year, uh, we have several classrooms throughout the district, and this is staffed with teachers that are dedicated to this and chose, really opted into this Kindergarten Launch Academy. And they are able to provide more support, and it's a two-year program, actually. So the parents commit to say, I know my child's not quite there, 
but this is almost sort of a pre-kindergarten experience, and then they have a second year. So we're very proud of that, and again, it's our one-stop shop. Parma Virtual Learning Academy. This is something that arose during the pandemic, but we always said that it was built to last. We're proud of the instruction that we offered virtually. We're proud of the fact that our teachers didn't stream. It wasn't, it wasn't an afterthought. We're proud of the fact that our teachers dedicated themselves to one function at a time. We're either teaching kids in front of us or teaching kids at home. It's very difficult, and if you have teachers in your family or you know teachers who had to try to do both at the same time. So Parma Virtual Learning Academy, this year is down to 42 or 423 students. Last year was about 2,200 as we endured the, the pandemic. And we want to continue this. We have had students in Parma in previous years who actually um, did not choose the Parma schools. They chose an online charter school. That shouldn't have to happen. You should still be connected to our schools. And PVLA will allow us to do that. We don't anticipate it'll be 423 next year, uh, but we will continue to have this option for families who choose that, that home environment for their children. And finally, Parma Alternative Secondary School, or PASS. Uh, this is for students that just weren't able to get over that hump. The typically fourth year or fifth year seniors who just without this different environment, which by the way is right there, uh, without this different environment, they were going to be lost. And so we've graduated now dozens. Uh, in fact, I think, what's our number? 55, 60 students from PASS. Those are students that without PASS, they wouldn't have high school diplomas now. And so that's 55 to 60 different families who have different trajectories in their lives because we were able to offer a different program. We are large enough, we are strong enough, we are creative enough to continue to meet multiple student needs within our district. We also, our second goal is improving transparency. And we always talk about making sure that somehow our community feels connected to us. Making sure that we're not just, you know, this bottom line on those property taxes that why, why we pay what to what? What to who? We want to make sure that there is some type of value to every resident in our community. And part of the way we do that is to promote our opportunities on social media. Certainly social media in this day and age is, is First of all, it's extremely important because people are on it. But second of all, second of all it's very efficient. It's, it's, it's much more cost effective than you know, a traditional mailing. So Facebook, we continue to grow. A year ago at this time, we were at 11,500 followers. This year, we're at 12,540. Our likes have increased as well. Instagram have gone from 2,500 to 3,488. Twitter, 4,000 to 4,500. And our website has had 675,000 views. So we continue to make sure that we have such great stories to tell, and we continue to use as many different fora to tell those stories as we possibly can. We also, when I talked before about transparency, a piece of that is getting people into our schools, making sure that, that they, again, feel that connection. So regardless of whether you have children in the Parma schools or you're an alumni of the Parma schools, if you live in Seven Hills, Parma Heights, or Parma, we want you to see us as adding value to your community. Our walking is underway right now, Monday and Thursday, from 6 to 8 p.m. at all three high schools. It's important that you have that knowledge, so that when residents say, there's nowhere to go here, since you tore down Parma Town, where do I go walk? Our high schools are open, and we're proud to open our doors to our residents and have a good number of people taking advantage of that. Swimming, provided we can find lifeguards, which sometimes has been a little bit of a challenge, uh, but we do staff the Parma Senior High pool. Eventually, there's going to be music, too, so just, just wait till the music comes. Uh, but that's on Saturdays and Sundays from 1 o'clock to 2.30. That's actually a joint venture with the Parma Recreation Department. So thank you to Mayor DeGeter and Director Vitardi for their cooperation on that. We are again holding an Easter egg hunt. If you were able to attend that last year, many of you actually sent eggs, and we really appreciate that. We'll be soliciting that from, that from you again. Uh, that's, that'll be April 9th at Byers Field. Honestly, one of the best activities I've ever attended. Um, that we had thousands there. We had literally 50,000 eggs on the field. No one walked away without probably more eggs than they could hold in their little baskets. So please help us to promote that. Please attend. Please donate eggs if you can. We also started last year, and we're proud of this as well, movie nights at Byers Field. Again, trying to make sure that all of our community sees value in what we offer. Uh, July 7th, 14th, 21st, and 28th at 8 p.m. at Byers Field. Uh, we have to wait a little bit until it's dark, obviously, but we have a beautiful scoreboard that we purchased from our permanent improvement levy uh, funds several years ago. We're proud to show that off, and we had many different families 
take advantage of this, and we look forward to another summer uh, of movies at Byers Field. Turning to fiscal responsibility. Uh, just a few highlights because it really has been a source of strength uh, in our district. Being able to stay off the operating levy ballot, we haven't passed new operating money or any money since 2011. We're coming up on 11 years. That's pretty rare for a public school system to go 11 years without getting an influx of new money. Uh, so we're proud of, proud of this realm of our practice. You may have heard of ESSER funds and you may have seen this in the paper and we try to be very transparent about this. We did get quite a bit of money from the federal government. We have invested that primarily in social emotional learning. Uh, one of those aspects is smaller class sizes, particularly in K-4. to We kept them much lower than we had in, in the past. We knew that students would have more needs and students would, would really not be ready to be in those 25 and 26 and 27 student environments. We added to our counseling staff. We added home liaisons, which really connect our school district with uh, resources throughout the community, or connect our families, I should say, uh, as well as curricula, social emotional curriculum, uh, that we make sure that, again, it's that character building piece, it's that resiliency piece, uh, that grit that we're really trying to teach kids as they work through our school district. Another point that we're proud of is our students with disabilities, and I mentioned Mr. Hoon before. In terms of outplacements, and again, this is, this is first of all, it's harsh, right? You say to a parent or a family, we can't educate your kid here. They're going to have to take a bus across town or they're going to have to go over to steps in a different part of town. That, that's a harsh piece. And the reality of that is often once we sent a student or a family, that was it. They would finish that pathway and they wouldn't come back. We always tried to get them back, but often that became their home. That became their de facto. For us, we've done a great job, and again, this is Mr. Hoon's leadership, of cutting down on that. In August of 2019, we had 94 students placed outside the district. That cost four point, almost $4.5 million. These placements, as I said, are harsh from an emotional standpoint. They're harsher from a financial standpoint to the district. In August of 2021, we had cut that almost in half, and that had a commensurate decrease in tuition that we had to pay. We were down to $2.6 Told you the music's coming, right? Who wants to dance? Come on, somebody's got it. There you go, thank you, Terry. Thank you. We appreciate you take, falling on the sword there. So almost a, dec or a decrease of a little bit over. Wow, and then there's chimes and everything. The sound effects are the highlight of the speech so far. We'll talk more about the need for new schools later. Uh, savings of 1.8 million. We also talked before about ACEs and how the development of that programming for autistic students uh, has saved us $1.3 million per year. It's a phenomenal program. Our parents write to us and thank us for that program and tell us, my gosh, without ACEs, I'm not sure where my child would be. We also continue, it's been part of our mission since, since I started here in 2018, reduce the central office. Resources belong where kids are. We should not be ever what's considered top heavy. Put the resources closest to the students. A, there's more help for kids, but B, if we're ever gonna move the needle on instructional leadership, if we're ever gonna move the needle on achievement, our principals have to be in the classrooms. If our principals are the only adults in their schools and they're putting out fires all day long, they can't be the instructional leader. They can't have an arm around a teacher saying, hey, maybe we could try this approach. Or, you know, I, I saw that assessment that you're given. Is that really what we're trying to, trying to aim for here? We have to have our teachers feel a sense of accountability. And we have to employ that through our principals that are being in the classrooms. It's not about gotcha. It's not about saying they're doing a bad job. It's about saying, let's make sure that read, write, discuss model, it's not just a poster. It's not just a saying. It's something that we live every day. And we ask our principals to do that. And as a result, $1.5 million, million we've cut from the central office. We don't need it here. It needs to be in a school. This is our five-year forecast. This is not a fun number. This is not something that we're, you know, you don't talk about this at parties with your friends, right? But it's something that you have to know. And for us, we're in a relatively good place in that we don't turn red, meaning we don't really start to run into needing that operating levy like right now until 2026. In 2026, we do project an $8 million deficit. So as much as that seems like way far away, 
we're already making decisions right now that are going to try to reduce that. Because the longer we can stay off the ballot for operating money, the better we are, the better chance we have of passing that, and the better chance we have of, of, of making sure that our, our residents really understand the need for, for the why behind it. So we are going into contract negotiations with our teachers unions and really all of our classified folks. It's about 1,600 different employees. And as much as we have this ESSER money and people can look at us and say, well, you got a $28 million balance. Yeah, but look what happens in 2026. Our fear is that we will again go through what all of you lived, much more than I did, because I was still on the other side of town, what all of you lived in 2016 with folks taking to the streets and marching and you know, even before that when our high school kids were going home after four periods. Our goal is to stay off of that ballot and stay out of that round of devastating, dramatic cuts. That's our goal. And so even though we have these negotiations this summer, it's not something. We all wish we could give all of our employees, right? 5.5% raises every year, give them a stipend too. We have to operate in this reality. We will always have a, a, a bottom line, and our bottom line is our five-year forecast. We've done a great job of keeping it healthy to this point, but that does not last forever. This is my favorite part, right? So those are all of our highlights. But then we get to this part, and this is about the aspirational piece of this state of the schools. This is the aspirational piece of what we're trying to create as a school district. The first is that we talked about a one-stop shop before. So looking ahead, we've done a lot for students with disabilities. We've done a lot for the students who maybe needed some type of alternative pathway to graduation. We haven't done as much in terms of an actual formal pullout program for the students at the top of the echelon. Now, we've worked really hard, and I know Mrs. Stropko had to step out, but we've worked really hard at having more AP classes and having more honors classes. We're actually offering a full new cycle of honors classes for middle school students next year. But we haven't had that, that ACEs type phenomenon. So our vision is in the year 2023-24 to open a truly elite gifted school. Now there's really only one in the area, and that's down in Cleveland, and many of our parents actually send our students to that school. And so we want to make sure that they stay right here in Parma. If we can do it for ACEs, if we can do it for PASS, if we can do it for PVLA, we can do it for our best and brightest students. Our goal this year is simply to, to really start the planning effort. So next year, we would identify a program leader, and they would have a full year. They would have their, their, their job still. We're not going to, you know, we don't have enough money to just appoint somebody and that's all they do. They'll still have their job. But then as they can and as they have time, they'll be working at the planning of this. It's the same exact model we followed with ACES. We named the leader one year early, that leader planned, and then implemented it the following year. We've had great success with ACES. We believe that PAGE, or the Parma Academy of Gifted Enrichment, can have the same effect. When we talk about elite, this is going to be the piece that will be hardest. Because as parents, you probably have felt this at times. I know I have felt it. Sometimes you feel like, no, my, my kid belongs there. My kid deserves that. My kid had this score. Reality is, we mean elite. So this isn't going to be parental choice. It'll be parental choice into. But just because a parent wants their child in, it's not going to necessarily mean that the child will get in. There will be hard cut scores. And there will be hard qualifications that even families have to meet to stay in PAGE. But we view this really as a pipeline to the Ivy League, a pipeline to a military academy, a pipeline to a place like RTI. We want to make sure our best and brightest are going to those elite universities. We believe that we have the tools here. We have the faculty. We certainly have the size and the facilities. And we look forward to PAGE being a phenomenal offering starting in 2023-24. We also want to talk a little bit about building our future. And so building our future is our plan, our planning process, I should say, that we're going through to make sure that we are somehow able to galvanize our community behind the plan, a plan, to build new schools. So a few things, a given. We're looking at, again, a ballot issue in November of 2022. We want to again try to take advantage of the state's now 37% of what their contribution toward this construction effort would be. We do not want to renovate. We've showed a lot of statistics and prices of what renovation would cost. It's around $250 million, which is a pretty substantial price tag. To really have the same buildings, they might just look a little bit better. 
So we want to make sure we'll be ready to take advantage of that in November 2022. We've also said that our current model is not a fiscally responsible model. So regardless of whether we can pass, the day has come to close schools in our Parma schools. We want to give this one more shot. We want to give this November of 2022, but we're also going to be very clear about what happens if it doesn't pass. There were literally people, when asked why they voted no in the spring for the old six and two model, six elementaries, two secondary schools that would both have, uh, or two secondary campuses with a middle school and a high school, folks actually said to us, well, you know what, I kind of like it the way it is now, so why would I vote yes to increase my taxes and we have to be very clear that we can't sustain the way it is now. That what we have now in terms of an 833 model is simply not the Parma of 2022. May have worked very well for Parma of the 1970s and 1980s, but our population has shrunk in our schools. We're 9,300 students. We're not 16,000. We're not 24,000 anymore. We have to close, but we don't want to renovate. We want to open new schools. We want to have the best and, and, and most exciting and opportunistic environments for our students as they progress through. We've had a few core values of our senior leadership team. Uh, Deb Vanek is a member of our senior leadership team as well. She's been an instrumental member of this. Carl Schneider is uh, over operations and resources, uh, or human resources. He's been an integral member of this. We work together each week, and we've come together with the fewer is better concept. So we want to make sure that we're able to concentrate resources Folks have said concentrating resources takes opportunities away from kids. You're not going to have three football teams anymore. Well, maybe you're not, but you know what? Maybe you can have a better freshman team and then a better JV team, and those can actually be full teams, not just the 14 kids who didn't get to play on Friday night dressing up on Saturday morning. Numbers don't always equate to opportunities, certainly not quality opportunities. And so we have to make sure that when we're putting something forward, it's our best. It's quality. It's not just an extra freshman team because we think we should have one and there's eight kids who want to do it. It's not economically efficient. Quite frankly, it's not the best opportunity for kids. So when we're able to concentrate resources, we believe that we can offer better opportunities. Our benchmark is a 50% reduction in schools. Now, one of the plans that you'll see is down to eight. Right now, we're at 15. One of the plans would take us down to eight, which is still a little bit above 50%, but it's, it's close. The others are all seven or below. We believe that our footprint of our district, meaning the lands we have and the population we have, can easily equate to seven facilities or less. The last piece is socioeconomic status will not dictate the number of campuses we seek to construct. We will, and, and not, I'm not, I'm not idealistic, you know, I, I don't get up here and preach, at least I, I hope that's not what you're thinking. I'm, I'm pretty pragmatic. But one thing that we can't accept is people to say, our kids can't handle that. We will never accept our kids can't handle that. That will never be something that we base our decisions on. Our kids can handle it because A, they're capable. B, their families want it for them. C, we have talented teachers. D, we have administrators who I would put up against anybody in Northeast Ohio. And E, we're gonna work smartly with architects to make sure that any facility we design and build equips and is equated for the population that it's going to serve. So we will not say, ah, uh -uh, you know what, that's too, many, that's too many kids at one place for our kids. We're not, this isn't a, only a building our future, but we've done a lot to show how you can make new buildings very separate. You can have different wings. You can have different pods. You can lock down a part of a building. So that's what we've really been trying to preach in our building our future piece. So we've had um, educated community members, and again, our, our goal is to develop a consensus facilities plan we know that any one of us could go into a, a room right now and come out and say, here's what you should do. But we're trying to work. We've got a group of about 45 uh, individuals from throughout the community, trying to work through them to make sure that we can have a consensus plan that the Board of Education can say, this wasn't just five people on a board. This wasn't just Dr. Smilek or Dr. Schneider or Mrs. Vanek's plan. This was actually a community plan. We're trying to do the best we can to build that. Guiding questions. We want more opportunities. How do we use our size to our advantage? For too long, our size has been actually a weakness. We try to create the same opportunities across too large of a footprint, and the result is holes. The result is, is a thin pizza crust that we've talked about in some of our meetings. How can we design a plan that inspires certain communities? We know that Seven Hills, Parma, and Parma Heights have to be represented in that plan. 
We may not get 50% in all three communities, but we better be represented so that everyone across the school districts feels like there's a benefit to that plan for them. Our first two months were about educating. We are actually now in the planning mode. You may have seen surveys. They're available online. We also mailed it to all of our residents. So in March and April, we're really looking at those surveys and planning. In May, it's go time. We can't wait until September and say, oh, there's a bond issue on the ballot. It's go time in May. We have to start getting into meetings and neighborhood associations and ward meetings and whatever might be happening from May on. Because we really believe if we can educate people as to the advantages, we can pass. Here's our different models, and these are potential models. The, the final model that we actually recommend may or may not actually be one of these. But just so that we had some place to start the conversation, just so we had some place to really, you know, people could focus their ideas and their efforts around these concepts, the green was one elementary, one middle, and one high. So you'd, you'd have three different properties throughout the city. All of your elementary went here, all your middle went here, and then all your high went here. The white, three K through 12s with CTE. So it would be a K through 12 experience on the same campus. That was one of the ones, or that is one of the ones that we're trotting out and trying to get people to react to. One is the red, and that's what we went with last time. That was six elementaries and two secondaries. So the secondaries are six through 12. And then the blue, four elementaries, one middle, and one high. All of those have career tech attached to the actual uh, uh, facility. When we talked to our career tech folks, and Ms. Plagiaman wasn't able to make it today, uh, but she's really clear that kids don't want to be on buses going across town. I talked before about what an advantage it is to have the programs in-house. So we want to make sure that we're able to, to reduce that travel time. They'll be here. Some of you have seen this before, but to me this is a really dramatic graphic. These are all the school districts. Before I said 37%. These are all the school districts who have participated in that OFCC process. $11 billion invested, 350 school districts. More than half, folks. 608 school districts in Ohio. 350 have built new schools. 1,000 different schools. Again, the OFCC will make a 37% contribution. I can't tell you what all these numbers are right here, right now. But there's an awful lot of blue dots that are centered right around Parma. And how sad that is for our community and how sad that is for our kids. None of that has happened here. We're better than that. We've talked before. You've heard me use this phrase, social fabric. We still have PTAs. We still have a Kiwanis Club. We still have a Chamber of Commerce. We still have people who care, who aren't looking to move out, who are looking to invest, who are looking to say, I want to set up shop in this school district for a K through 12 experience for my kids. We're better than this. You don't have to go far to think about other districts that have made that happen. That's theirs, right? A lot of excitement in Berea right now. We were excited this year because we threw some paint on Normandy. I wish I was kidding. We painted it. That was our improvement. Berea kids get a brand new facility. Our kids got paint. This is our record. To build the facilities that we're talking about, to build the facilities that our kids deserve, to build the facilities that will rejuvenate our communities and become community hubs of pride and opportunity, we have to reverse this record. This is our record since 2000. These are our new asks for new money. Three of 21. Three times we've passed. And so when I'm talking to a group as powerful as a Chamber of Commerce, as powerful as elected officials, as powerful as community elders, we need your help. We can all look back at this and all say, could have, would have, well, did you try this? Did you? It's got to be a we. What can we try? What can we do? Because if this trend continues, this will never be reality here. And maybe next year we can paint Valley Forge. Maybe next year we can do the parking lot of Parma Senior High. But we have got to reverse this trend. And we all hold positions of influence. We all hold positions of leadership. 
None of you are here at this lunch right now without the ability to impact this chart. This is Parma Senior High. We actually had to run cords for new Ethernet outside of the walls. Who has to do that? Think Berea Mint Park had to do that? This is Normandy. Now, you can look and say, well, just put some new ceiling tile up there. We have time after time after time. We should invest in ceiling tile. If we can't pass a bond issue, we should invest in ceiling tile. Or we should invest in spackle. Because that's, that's what we're doing. Our kids deserve better. Your kids deserve better. You deserve better. This can be us. This is Akron. This isn't Hudson. This isn't Orange. This isn't Mason that we went down to by Cincinnati. This is Akron. They invested in their schools, and they've built these environments. And by the way, you know what it says right here? Community Learning Center. We showed you that slide before because we have every intent, not just to have walking clubs every now and again, and the pools are open, and the buyers. Our schools should be beacons of hope in our communities. That's what Akron did. That's what we can do. What can be our destiny, not just for us, but for our communities? We are growing, reading, writing, discussing, guiding, creating, collaborating, inventing, learning, exploring, discovering, competing. We are the Parma City School District. And I would also contend that with your help, we can be a better Parma City School District for all of us, for our communities, and most importantly for our kids, with all of your help. We will continue to ask for help. We'll make it very clear how you can help. That'll start in May once we have a... You want to watch the board meeting too? It's a YouTube channel. You can watch all things Parma. <laughs> so we appreciate your time today. We appreciate your attention. We have an ambitious goal. We have an ambitious vision. And we need all of us to try to help make that a reality. Thank you so much for your attention today.